and we are live. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. We're super stoked to have you here today uh, for how to optimize your internet for live streaming. One of the most important topics that you can discuss when it comes to live streaming and probably the first topic that you should discuss when it comes to live streaming. Um, my name is Josh Clements. I'm the community manager here at BoxCast. I produce all of our videos, and while my expertise is in video production, I know nothing about networking. I know nothing about the internet. I know just enough to get myself in trouble. And um, the guy to the left here, he's going to be explaining everything today and hopefully helping you and me understand more. I ask, I ask Gary 10 times a day different questions like, hey, what does QoS mean? And hey, why am I still getting packet loss? So uh, Gary, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey guys, I'm Gary Buchanan. I am a client success specialist here at BoxCast. I handle all of our technical uh, inquiries from our clients, um, from everything from, hey, why doesn't my graphic overlay work to, hey, why do I have packet loss? So it's good to be here, Josh. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, I appreciate it. and so sad that we can't be together, obviously for safety reasons, but we are remoting Gary in from Columbus and uh, we are watching, um, <laughs> Oh, sorry. We are I just realized my YouTube is That's playing. Yeah, we are using the internet, and uh, we're here in Cleveland, Ohio. Before we get started, I just want to run through real quick a couple housekeeping things so you guys know. Uh, first and foremost, you can, if you don't want to hear us ramble for the next 30 minutes or so, go ahead and just download the presentation slides in the description. There's a nice downloadable PDF that you know maybe while you're live streaming, you can reference and, and kind of uh, go back and take a look at. Uh, secondly, we are going to be doing a live Q&A after we get through the bulk of the presentation today. So go ahead and ask us questions in the chat box. We'll try to get to everybody. Um, we won't be able to moderate today like all the questions, but once we get to the end, we're going to look back and, and see who we can help. If we don't get to your questions today, then please, please reach out to us anytime at questions at boxcast.com and our support team will be more than happy to help you. That's what guys like Gary are actually here for. Here are for. Um, Third, okay, so we are assuming that you're new to this. I'm assuming you're like me a couple years ago where I didn't even know the difference between a hardline connection and a Wi-Fi connection. I didn't understand upload speed, first download speed, and you don't know the first thing about IT, and we totally get it. So um, some of you may be a little bit more experienced in this field, but we're gonna be talking like, like this is like kindergarten for, for IT live streaming. Um, anything else on that, Gary? Nope, that's pretty much it, man. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's dive in. Let's dive in. What is going on today? What's happening? Uh, so we're going to start by talking about the problem with sharing the internet. Gary's got a pretty good analogy for us. We're going to dive into upload speed versus download speed. We're going to discuss wired versus Wi-Fi. If you didn't notice that Gary and I are wearing t-shirts, then take a look right here. Because uh, if you don't take away anything else today, uh, know that no matter what, Ethernet is probably always going to be better than Wi-Fi. So Fact we literally we literally bought these just so you guys would that would sink in. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we're going to show you how to monitor stream diagnostics in the BoxCast dashboard. We're going to talk about network restrictions. The way I kind of laid out this presentation, we're going to start with the easy stuff to get your feet wet. And then near the end of the presentation, we're going to get into like the more advanced nitty gritty stuff that may not be so exciting, but stick with us. And then, of course, we'll do a live Q&A after the fact. Um, so let's talk about the internet. Let's talk about this beautiful, awesome thing that we get to surf through and that without, we could not have live streaming. Um, this graphic right here are the five key steps to a successful live stream. Reliable internet, a good video source, an encoder, a streaming service, and online viewers, of course. Um, the reason I wanna show this graphic is because without step one and uh, without a good internet connection, uh, that's solid and reliable, none of the other things matter. And Gary can definitely speak to this too, but we see all the time where people put all their eggs in the other baskets and then they forget about yeah. this step one, the most important thing. And right. I've done it before myself too. And then you're left, it doesn't matter how good your production ends up being. It doesn't matter if you have thousands of viewers. It doesn't even matter if you're using an awesome service like BoxCast, you're still gonna end up with kind of a a less than favorable live stream experience. Right, that internet, that reliable internet connection is actually your foundation for the entire live streaming experience. If without a foundation, a house cannot stand. And same thing with a live stream, it just cannot work. So a reliable internet connection is probably, like Josh has here in the graphic, number one. It's, it's and yeah, without that, everything else will, will fall apart. 
So that being said, uh, sorry to sound so grim. Uh, now let's change the mood a little here. <laughs> Gary, let's talk about pie. Oh, I like pie, Josh. Do you like pie? <laughs> I love I love any, well, most pie. I mean, I'm really like more of a filling guy than a crust guy, but. Okay, all right. Well, I was gonna say, you look more like a cake guy to me. But, um, <laughs> I'm like an anything you about... put in front of me kind of guy, so. <laughs> <laughs> I see food and eat it, I get that. Yeah. Man, I, so just imagine if you will your internal network connections all the things that you have running in either your home or maybe your church or maybe even in your business and imagine if you would a pie and that's exactly what the internet bandwidth is like um, inside of that internal network so at all routers all switchers what they do is they actually take the bandwidth that you're allotted and they try to di divide it up divvy it up equally amongst all connected devices so regardless if you have one device or 50 devices each device is getting an equal portion of that bandwidth and so the difficulty here is that when you have so many devices and such a, a limited amount of bandwidth you're taking up away from the biggest piece of pie that should go to your live streaming okay that did makes you sense. know josh yeah it makes sense right and did you know that also in that respect the average household has like 25 connected devices at one time sheesh that's like kind of overwhelming because i'm trying to picture it and i'm like well i have my phone i have my laptop and then my smart tv but i guess if you start to add it up yeah that's a little overwhelming yeah so i mean it is nobody ever thinks about the amount of devices and even in churches and and, and you know organizations and businesses between cell phones and ipads or you know tablets of any sort your smart tv even your smart devices like your Googles, your Alexas, even your HomePods, um, anything that we require, like your security camera systems, all require an internet connection. And so in regards to that, those are all devices taking a piece of that pie. Yeah, well that's, that's I mean, honestly, that's really good to know because if that's at the household level, then I can't even imagine how many connected devices there's gonna be at a church, at a stadium, at a school, even in a municipality building, anything right. like that. It's probably out of control. Um, and, and there's probably a ton of people. Yeah, absolutely. And granted, just to be, you know, I mean, churches and organizations like businesses may have a bigger infrastructure, and that's definitely a good thing. But, you know, most times those infrastructures have a bunch of other restrictions, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that being said, um, let's get out of the way the, the most, probably one of the most confusing things if you're, if you're new to all of this, which is the difference between upload speed and download speed. And, um, I know one thing I get confused all the time is like, oh, well, I have a fast internet connection. Like, why doesn't my live stream look good? Um, and that, w the thing we want to explain to you is like, there are two different type of internet connections. So if we have a slide here, actually, if you want to pull it up, Wade. Um, upload speed compared to download speed. Um, and they're two very different things. And we're basically, when you're trying to live stream, you're actually using upload speed. Um, it's used to send right. data. So anytime you're sending a photo, you're sending an email, you're, you know, like you're actually producing a live stream, you're sending it to your viewers, you're actually using your upload speed. Whereas if you're watching a live stream or you're watching Netflix or YouTube or you're receiving, you know, emails and, and photos from other people, you're using your download speed. So they're two very different things that your internet service provider provides for you. And because like most commonly uh, people do use download speed. Sometimes your upload speed is l typically less, you know, prioritized by your internet service provider. Um, so it's definitely one thing to consider when you're live streaming is like, you may have really fast internet, but do you have the, do you have fast upload as well? So right, absolutely. And on the flip side, like you know, like download speed, you know, obviously a ton of us use that on the daily basis and that's what we're using yeah. to watch everything cool. and that's what makes us think we have fast internet sometimes well take into consideration something that i you know i've learned over the past you know few years with internet did you know that netflix requires a 20 to 25 megabit connection download in order for you to be able to view 4k streaming that's nuts did you know that because that isn't it crazy because that's like, I think I have like 30 download, like total at my house. So <laughs> right. I'm struggling. So like, exactly. Like at my house, I have 100 down and 10 up. Right. So your ISPs are going to prioritize download speeds because that's what everybody wants is they want download. They want to download, 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 download. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And so the more connected devices you have, the more downloads you're doing, the more sending and trafficking of that information is coming down. 
and so they prioritize down over up the issue that you get here is like if you're trying to send something and you don't have enough bandwidth for the upload and right. your upload it could take forever or it could get lost in transit right so so then the, the next question people are going to ask is well how much upload speed do i need then and maybe you can kind of break right. down these different numbers and explain what each of them means um yeah man yeah so it we have to think in terms of your actual stream when you're streaming out to any kind of CDN or any kind of networking system that actually takes in your broadcast, transcodes it or sends it out. And and resolution is important as well because it's more information. So the way that we want you to kind of think about your internet speed, especially in your upload, is that there, there's two factors. One, if you're sending a 430 by uh, 480 by 30 signal, the recommended upload is going to be three megabits. And the reason for that is because you need to have almost double the amount of data space in order to send properly through, okay? And your minimum upload is going to be 600 kilobits. The same thing goes for 720 and 1080. You're going to double those amounts. So when we're in technical support and we're talking to clients, the, the biggest question is, is what, what should my upload speed be? And it's always, well, what do you intend to send? What's your bit rate going to be? And if you're going to send us five megabits, then you need to double it. You need to have it. Yeah. Megabit. yeah, that makes sense. The same thing with if you're using a pro version of that. Yeah. So it, and it, and the second thing that comes with that, Josh, is the fact that you have to always remember that your upload speed and your download speeds are actually speeds guaranteed by your ISP. That doesn't always mean it's the same thing as your internal network. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, because I remember when I started Boxcast, I would read charts like this and I'd be like, Okay, well, they say I need five megabits up. I have five. I mean, this was like a few years ago when the internet was really like not nearly as fast as it is now for most people. And I was like, okay, well, I have five up at this concert venue. Why is it not looking good? And it's, I mean, more often than not, just double, maybe even triple, quadruple what um, what upload you need for the live stream specifically. Double that for your network and, and you'll be okay. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and that usually the reason we double those speeds is not because of any reason like, hey, we you know you need to have a very quick connection. The the main reason for that is because if you're sending a lot of data and you're sending a lot mm -hmm. of packets to us, and if you start to lose some, and we'll talk about packet loss later, but when you start to lose some, there's still enough bandwidth for you to be able to transmit that data. Yeah, and so we we can still work with what you're sending. So if you're sending six and you have an upload of ten. That's still pretty decent. I mean, but we recommend doubling that just to make sure you got plenty of room to move yeah. maneuver. Yeah, no, that that makes complete sense. And if you're super super new to this, because some people might be asking, okay, well, um, you know, like how do I know how fast my internet is? Uh, all you have to do is run a speed test. So I'll show you how that looks real quick here. Um, if we just cut to my browser, all you have to do is go to speedtest.net, and this is a great a great. <laughs> Wait, uh, great. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm drinking too much. Word. I'm drinking too much coffee this morning. Um, that's a great way to get a quick, like, view of how fast your internet is. So go to speedtest.net, simply hit the go button, and uh, we're gonna be sitting pretty here because we are a live streaming company. So of course we have really fast internet. Um, but it's gonna, <laughs> what it's gonna do is it's gonna ping your network very quickly. Um, and then it's going to like tell you just about how fast this is. Yeah. So what a speed test actually does, Josh, is, is actually, it's actually taking small amounts of data and it's sending it from your network to the ISP server. And then it's relaying that and the server sends it back. So when you download, what you're seeing is you're, it's, it's actually pulling information from the server. Okay. And then it's sending information back to the server. And so it's pinging those times and then how quickly that information gets traveled. Now, I want you to also remember here, friends and family, that as important as a speed test is, and that's great, you need to make sure you have a great upload speed to do live streaming, or at least a decent upload speed. You also need to remember that that has no effect on your internal bandwidth, okay? Remember the pie scenario we talked about a little mm -hmm. bit ago? Your internal network is that pie, so the more you start taking from that bandwidth that's available in the network yeah. internally, not externally, you might have yeah. a little bit bigger of an issue. Yeah, that's a great point. The speed test is only going to tell you what your entire network can do. It's not going to tell you how much bandwidth your live stream has. So use that as a test, but don't see it as like, you know, like complete truth to everything and right. think you have a lot of upload and then 
yeah a lot right. of people are using their network there's so, all kinds of different factors that play into that you know routers and how yeah. old they are or you know firmware or you know if you're using cat 5 versus cat 5e or cat 6 yeah there's a whole bunch of stuff that plays into that yeah i've been caught in that trap a couple of times before where i'm like well the speed test looks good so what else could be wrong and that you don't take into <laughs> the other pieces of the pie Right, and then you text me asking me, "Hey, why is my yeah. internet bad?" <laughs> yeah, and I'm like sweating, and yeah, it's 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 a bad it's a bad combination. Um, but what is a good combination is what I'll show you next is this simple little formula. If you're just like, okay, so really, how do I get a good looking live stream? Um, how do I get a good internet connection? I mean, honestly, the best formula is a lot of upload speed in a very high video bit rate is going to give you the best video quality. And the way I compare Absolutely. it to yeah, I mean, the way, the thing I compare it to is like, you're just like, your internet connection is like a pipe and the amount of video data you send is like water. And if you want, um, you know, like if you want a lot of water pressure, just push a lot, have a bigger pipe and push a lot of water through it. Uh, same thing with a live stream. It's a good analogy to just think of like that live stream as a hose. <laughs> That's, uh, I, don't, I haven't even gotten all the way through this analogy yet. I think it's, it's falling <laughs> apart very quickly, but you guys kind of get what I'm saying by the visual. So bad live stream sense. is gonna look like something on the left where you know you have less than 500 kilobits and you probably don't have a lot of upload in the first place and you're not able to send a lot of data and a good live stream is gonna look like the thing on the right where you have more than 10 megabits available and, uh, and it's able to hold a consistent amount of high bit rate throughout the entire duration of your stream. Which is also important because right. live streaming, like a lot of people do for long form content. Um, and so it's really important to test your network for long periods of time and not just for five minutes or 10 minutes. But like what I like to do to bulletproof it is when I get to a new venue for shooting something, I like to just test it for two, three hours, maybe the whole time I'm there. So I know when I actually mm -hmm. go to stream this college graduation or this, this, you know, like baseball game, I know, okay, it's gonna hold throughout the entire thing. Right, um, and that's good advice. And, and and honestly, when we're in technical support here in the you know client success team, we tell clients. This is one of the things we tell clients all the time: is test, 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 test. Because tests can reveal, or we can help troubleshoot, or you can even backtrace any issues that are occurring. Right. And so you know, if you're starting to see constraints on your network because you've got, you, you know, your senior pastor, the worship pastor, and all, you know, your preschool downstairs they're just consuming bandwidth then you know that on a sunday morning for example for a church those things aren't going to be there so it's possible that you're going to have a better connection and more bandwidth av availability yeah. so yeah absolutely test 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 man that's a great point speaking of testing i also like to bring this up to people especially people that work in audio you wouldn't start recording or go live with a worship service or start a like a sports broadcast without doing a mic check real quick same thing applies for live streaming. Don't start a live stream without testing your network first. Um, that's Back. gonna be the most important thing. So, you know, guys, just play it safe. This is my PSA for the day. Always test ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll show you actually how easy that is to do in the BoxCast dashboard. Um, this might be something a lot of people don't realize uh, that is available. If you hop into your dashboard before you go live, this is a quick shortcut, and you go down to sources, and this is the box we're using to broadcast, but say we had a box here that we wanted to go live with, all you have to do is click it and you can click start bread start test broadcast. You don't have to schedule ahead of time. This will just fire up a live stream automatically for you. Um, so that's a nice little shortcut just to, to get a sense of how things are doing. Um, and then, you know, we're gonna hop into the dashboard in a little bit here again, just to show you uh, also how to use stream diagnostics and while you're streaming, understand how your network's performing. Um, but one more time, let's just reiterate, because you probably already get the idea, hardline ethernet is always better than Wi-Fi. There are some secure Wi-Fi connections. Gary, I'm sure you know that work really well as long as as long as you've done you know, your due diligence and you've checked it and you make sure not a lot of people are using it. But that being said, right. never use public or guest Wi-Fi. No, um, never, never. Just always no. gonna. I've been in situations where I've like used my phone hotspot, and it's okay. done better than than guest or public Wi-Fi because there's just like you never know who's gonna hop into that connection. They're usually not made to be very fast because they're not prioritized. That's why they're guest Wi-Fi connections. So just try to avoid those at all costs. Um, Absolutely, yeah. It's a pitfall. And, and one of the. Yeah, and, w and one of the other things I would say about this, especially with, with hardwire versus Wi-Fi, okay, mm -hmm. um, is the fact that uh, if you can 
if you can actually do a hardwire connection, that is the most preferred. And the reason for that, especially with BoxCast, and, and, and any actually CDN will tell you that, that a hardwire connection is preferred over Wi-Fi. And, here, and there are two reasons why. One, hardwire connection is a physical connection, right? Okay. So when you're actually making a physical connection from a, your modem or router to an actual device, you're running a wire, and it's more stable because it's less prone to interference, yeah. and it also has a, f a farther connection. If you are streaming, and secondly, if you're streaming over Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi signals are radio signals. I don't think any a lot of people understand that. They're just like, well, mm -hmm. I got Wi-Fi. It works, right? I mean, yeah. You've done that to me, Josh. Yeah. You've looked at me and said, well, I have Wi-Fi. It's right here. Why is my internet <laughs> Why <laughs> so, I have no internet, Gary. That might Why be like the internet. <laughs> yeah, I get a text at four o'clock in the morning, and he's never there trying to watch his cat videos. Yeah, but that's the thing. So on Wi-Fi, it's a radio signal, and radio signals can be interfered with. And I'll give you a prime example of this. The other day, um, it's beautiful. It's sunny outside. We're driving our car. I'm listening to a radio show on the radio as I drive through the a forested area. I start to lose the signal. Why? Because there's leaves on the trees, and radio signals are affected by interference what? by blocking. <laughs> yeah, it, it happens all the time. And when it happens with your cell phone when you're driving through a mountains or if you're driving through a dead zone where the signal just doesn't reach yeah. and there's too much interference. So it's the same concept with live streaming on a Wi-Fi connection. Now, right. granted, Wi-Fi has increased a little bit. It's gotten better over time because you can get to a 2 and a, a 2.4 network or a 5G network, but streaming over Wi-Fi is is not always the best solution. And we understand here at Boxcast as the technical support team that there are going to be those moments where you actually have to go over Wi-Fi. And we just we just try to reiterate to our clients, make sure it's really strong and mm -hmm. you're as close to the router and you know, Wi-Fi router as you can be. Make sure that you can connect correctly. Um, you don't have any other signals or any other things coming into the building that's going to you know, affect yeah. that stream. Yeah, that's good advice. I can't believe, uh, I can't believe like leaves can get in the way of a signal like yeah, that. Yeah, man. So more of the story yep. really is, Gary, if you are going to be using Wi-Fi, don't plant a tree in the middle of your church or <laughs> sanctuary or in the middle right. of the field. Right, don't, don't plant a tree in your church. And don't yeah. call me because at that point I can't. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing we can do about that. So a really cool feature that we actually have at BoxCast is the ability to monitor stream diagnostics. It's kind of like a very underrated thing that I've even just started using as I get more in depth on the networking side of things just to feel more confident about how my stream is doing or to be alerted about any issues. So the best way to show you how stream diagnostics work, um, I'll just show you the actual broadcast that we're streaming right now. So this is the stream that we have live. I'll click into view broadcast details. And um, this is just like the main editing event page. And then I can click down here on this diagnostics tab and this is actually going to give me alerts. It's going to warn me when things are going wrong. And it's just going to give me real time data like on how the stream is performing. So right now we can see we're streaming at just a solid 30 frames per second um, at three megabits, you know, like for the bit rate. The reason that you might be seeing that is because we're on like a still image right now and box cast like adaptive bit rate streaming. If you're cutting between a still image or a moving picture, it will lower and adjust your bit rates. So that it, it, you know, it just is, it's the most efficient way of streaming and, and making the most out of your network. So you're not just always pushing out tons of data for no reason. You can also click on these two tabs right here and it will show you graphs and it will show you alerts. Obviously, because again, you saw we have a pretty good internet connection here. There's nothing to worry about, but it's kind of nice to just check in and see um, if, if you're really into it and the broadcast is mission critical just to see how things are doing. And again, you can see here, this is what's actually interesting because we're cutting between slides and live video of Gary and I side by side. You can see when we cut the slides, the Boxcaster, the Boxcaster Pro's bit rate actually just drops way down because it doesn't need to use that much data. And then when, we, when Wade cuts back to us, we can see that we're using a lot more data again. Other thing that's nice is you can just make sure, now this is very unlikely to change, but you can just feel confident that you're constantly getting the same frames per second. Um, and then you can also check like your simulcast, um, you know, frames per second too, because that's important to a lot of people. And if we had packet loss, luckily we don't here today, but if we did, this is where that would be reported. And uh, in the next few slides, we're gonna go into like what packet loss is, how to avoid it and how to recognize it. So yeah, any other thoughts on stream diagnostics, Gary? 
Yeah, so your stream diagnostics are really a cool thing. Um, I know we just recently made an update. Our engineering and IDS teams have been pounding away at some of these really awesome features. And one of them was to actually separate in the diagnostic stream your video bit rates from your audio bit rates. Now, just remember, your audio bit rates over the Internet don't take up a whole lot. Um, so it's always going to be smaller and mm -hmm. it's always going to be less than your video because video has a lot more data per present. But that's one of the coolest features that we just updated. I think it was maybe a month ago that we started rolling that out is that now you have audio and video bit rates yeah. separated in the system. But yeah, that's it's definitely uh, the diagnostics tool. Yeah, diagnostics tool is definitely one of those things that um, y you keep an eye on it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and of course, we're always here at BoxCast to help explain it and give you some more information um, as we go through and we can look at the servers and stuff too. So Okay, good to know. So now on to the thing that I still don't understand and I'll probably never understand unless you explain it to me 10 more times. Um, let's talk about network restrictions and let's start by QoS. What the heck yeah. is QoS? I put this I put this, uh, this GIF here because I still don't get it. <laughs> Maybe you can explain it to me for the 10th time. I'll do my best, man. I think the first time you asked me is what is COS? I think that's what you're trying to <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah, what's COSI? <laughs> what is COSI? <laughs> what is what is COS? You know, yeah. So when we talk about terms of restrictions or when we talk about what we call QoS, QoS is a networking term called quality of service. It just literally refers to as a technology or a, a system in place that manages networks to um, and it helps to monitor bandwidth. And a lot of times QoSs are done through managed networks or managed switches or managed systems. Um, and so what you can see is that most consumer routers, uh, Josh, that they don't offer a QoS system. Now, your more advanced routers are starting to come out. Like, uh, for example, the uh, Netgear Nighthawk does have some QoS built into it or a Cisco Meraki router or maybe even a Ubiquiti router um, or a hotspot or what they call an access point. Though, but the most consumer routers, like something you'd pick up off the shelf maybe over at Walmart for 45 bucks, mm -hmm. those typically don't have QoS built into them as well as some routers will give you advanced options for seeing and managing the router or even the switch um, that they will have that feature built in. So you can actually set quality of service. Now to expand mm -hmm. a little bit, just for a second, quality of service is really about managing network traffic. Okay. And it's saying that, um, if, for example, if you have our nifty box caster, if you're, if you're a box cast client and you have our box caster, um, you can take your box caster, plug it into your managed network and on your managed network, you can see it via the Mac address mm -hmm. and then you can whitelist it, which basically just means taking it outside of any firewalls. And then you can also set a bandwidth control. So you can say on Sunday mornings, I want this box, I want this MAC address to have all the upload bandwidth it can take. Okay. And so that's, so you, that's how quality of service works. Yeah. You essentially tell your IT guy, let the box caster have more pie. Uh, yep, exactly. You're, <laughs> or, you're divvying out more pie. Yeah, you're just saying like, you're just saying I want the box caster or whatever whatever encoder you're using you're saying I need this to take priority over everything else in the network. Exactly. You're setting a priority for your device. And and by the way, this could be anything. It it could be a computer. Um, it could be an iPhone or a tablet. Mm -hmm. It could be the box caster or even a hardware encoder like an AJ uh, Hilo. Yeah. It can be literally anything that has a MAC address and a network connection. Awesome. Good to know. Um, thank you for explaining that. I'll ask you again in a week. So now moving on to now moving Questions on to boxcast.com. Yeah, yeah, I'll just, I'll just email support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about let's talk about firewalls now, because that is the one thing that can trip a lot of people up when the boxcast is not getting along, getting online. So maybe you can explain those and and why they can be tricky when it comes to live streaming. Yeah, so think of a firewall as like your internet ne network connection's personal bodyguard, okay? So it's an internal network security feature that it literally prohibits or allows incoming and outbound traffic, okay? So if you think about it, if incoming traffic is anything you're downloading, outbound traffic is anything that you're uploading. So this is why it's important to understand the terms a little bit 
so you get a good idea as to what you're doing on the network. And most firewalls, if you think about this in terms of um, security, let's say you're trying to get into a premiere, Josh, mm -hmm. all right? and we know you've tried to sneak into a few. Oh yeah, um, I mean, that's how I you, get video you're drives. Trying to, you're trying to go to a video, a premiere, you're, you're trying to get in to be, have that first access and the bodyguard steps in front of you and says, no, sir, you can't come in. That's exactly what a firewall will do. And most firewalls will actually block ports. And those ports are literally links or channels that link out to specific server requirements. So in this regard, BoxCast requires specific ports to be open in order to connect to our cloud server mm -hmm. um, and in order for those data. And they're, they're technically media ports. So we have to be very selective. And, and if you check out our, our BoxCast uh, articles, um, it, right there in your dashboard, you can click on the need help button at the bottom and just type in the word port um, or uh, port requirements. And you'll actually get an article that pops up that shows you all the port requirements and how to actually whitelist your box on your network. Okay. Um, so so white firewalls are important because they help protect your network. Um, but opening the ports needed and whitelisting your box is probably one of the easiest things you can do most consumer routers, most consumer routers, as well as most advanced routers, do give you what's called DMZing. So it's a demilitarized zone. It's literally what it means. Oh, it means demilitarized zones. Yeah. Now you're talking. I mean, I got you, man. See, <laughs> I mean, so basically it's taking your box on the network and it's moving it outside of the firewall requirement or okay. restriction. Okay. So it's separating it saying, hey, this is its own entity. It has free reign, but the rest of our network doesn't. Okay. Okay, cool. That makes sense. That makes sense. And uh, you can see here in the slide, um, thank you for explaining. You can see here in the slide, there's like these blue text that's underlined. If you download the slides, you there's a link to BoxCast firewall requirements like Gary was mentioning. Ooh, you're I smart. I know, I work in marketing. Anyway, um, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's talk about packet loss, the hottest topic in live streaming network IT, packet loss. What is it? How, how can we recognize it and how can we avoid it? Josh, has Amazon ever, ha, well, let me ask you this. Have you ever bought a puzzle from Amazon? Uh, no, but- That's a no, I can I bought a lot no. of, I, bought, <laughs> I buy something from Amazon too often, unfortunately. Okay, all right. So let's imagine if you will that uh, Amazon is sending you a puzzle, but they're gonna send it to you in chunks, okay? So, you know, it's a thousand piece puzzle and they're gonna send it to you in a hundred pieces at a time. Okay. All right. All right, so packet loss is the same scenario here. Amazon's sending you a puzzle and it's sending it to you in pieces. When you live stream with us, you're sending data over your internet mm -hmm. in pieces. Now yeah, like little video will, pieces, right? Little bitty pieces, right? And then imagine if you will, Amazon is sending you those 100 pieces and you're getting, you're getting 10 bags. Those packets, those little pieces of data you get and you put it all together when it arrives and you're missing 40 or 50 of them. What happens to your to your uh, your image it's a missing yeah there's a puzzle with missing pieces there's a puzzle and, with missing pieces. you got a big and, hole in that cat puzzle that yeah. you just purchased and then you right? just spent three pieces. hours three plus hours putting together a puzzle and you realize you're missing pieces and right. you just you feel dumb so I packet <laughs> loss packets in general yeah you feel dumb, you just right? throw away but, the puzzle and, and you move throw on it away <laughs> it's out the door but packet loss in general is exactly the same thing here in the scenario that we're talking about. Packet loss is when you send data through your network and, it get, and it's traveling from one location to another. And what ends up happening is that packet loss is we're missing those data pieces. We're missing those packets, those little square pieces that we need to put the video together. So some symptoms of packet loss would include like degraded video quality or even audio quality. It may say warbled or underwater. Your video oh, may yeah. look smeared or pixelated. And a lot of times there's that ghosting effect. Um, and then you would also see slow network speeds because typically packet loss is indeed tied to having slow networks. And this is not speed test related, okay? This is just literally like maybe your ISP is choking the signal, you're using it over a cellular connection and you're getting throttled. Yeah. So you're gonna see packet yeah. loss occurring there. And this picture right. to the right is like a good example of in your BoxCast diagnostics, what it'll look like yep. if, if your network's just getting hammered, so. Yep, and that is a le that is actually a legit screen like it's a legit screen grab of, of somebody's diagnostics, yeah. right Josh? Somebody was having a rough day. 
<laughs> yeah, they were having a really bad rough day. And then, and then we can see a little bit more data, not as much um, on your diagnostics, but through our systems, we can see more. But so I guess the main question then is, okay, if we're sending data and we're losing packets, how do we prevent this ha from happening? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a couple of things always hardwire <laughs> okay hardwiring especially yes yeah pull the shirt out yeah. hardwiring is always one of the primary ways to help um, eliminate or alleviate any packet loss and that's mm -hmm. because sometimes packet loss occurs over wi-fi because you're getting interference um, setting up that quality assurance that we talked about quality of service getting mm -hmm. that that quality of service established making sure that you have a dedicated bandwidth to the device yeah. that you're streaming with yeah um, and allotted for that streaming um, a limit network congestion and connections so a lot of uh, organizations will actually add a hundred devices they start kicking other devices off the network um, and that's important because you don't need so many pieces of the pie being taken off yeah yeah and then right the bigger the slice the better the, the quality yeah um, using quality cabling I cannot stress this enough okay Using a janky Ethernet cable that you found at a thrift store is probably not the best idea. Okay? <laughs> um, uh, I'm looking at I Wade over here, and I'm like, dude. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> They're all like, hey, we use those. Buy all the time, nice man. cables. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and I think we had a problem, like some, we were like setting up for the, the, for our webinar and they were using some kind of janky audio cable, right? Cause it's yeah. not quality. Yeah. So you use quality cabling. And in fact, I highly recommend, and this is just me because I'm a nerd that you learn how to make your own cables because then you know that they actually work. Yeah. Right? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> see, <laughs> I, I understand one? what you're saying by that, but if I made my own cables, there's, I'm just, I'm just creating more risk there. <laughs> But I, I do well, get if you be, do know it. Yeah, I do. I it's do. It's not it. difficult to do. It really isn't. It's very easy. Yeah, that's Once what... you learn how to do it, it's all easy. Yeah. So okay. I mean, <laughs> your fingers cramp up a lot, but that's okay. And so, and the last thing I would suggest here is that if you are doing long runs for internet, make sure that you're shortening the distance somehow. So that's either by putting in a, a network switch that's going to help repeat the signal, mm -hmm. or if you if you are on Wi-Fi get closer to the Wi-Fi router or, you know, don't let there be too many things that's blocking yeah. your connection, like a wall yeah. or something in that, or that tree you put in the middle of your sanctuary. Yeah. No, so, that's, that's great Josh, advice. Don't, don't we have, yeah, don't yeah. We have Wait, an do example you wanna, of packet loss? Do you want to pull? Okay. So I, this isn't a real example, but I, I edited a, a good looking video to make it look bad, to make it kind of look like packet loss. So we're going to play it for you just so, in case you're wondering, okay, what are these guys talking about? What does this look like? So go ahead and, and roll that. So this is a Beautiful live stream footage. Yeah. <laughs> this is a live stream we did for an MMA fight recently, but let's say if the network was starting to hit a wall, you would see things like this start to happen. The picture would get very pixelated because there's not enough video packets being received. Sometimes you'll see uh, smearing on the screen because there's literally so much data missing that, that that's, that's the effect that you get. Um, so, and then other things will happen, what we call artifacting and ghosting, like you can see there, where when movement happens, you can still see remnants of the movement. Almost, it's weird. It's like a bad slow motion look um, where things will actually just ghost. And then obviously that's not a good playback experience because there's literally video packets that are just being dropped left and right. So this is Completely. kind of a, this is kind of what it looks like. It might go in and out. It might get, it might even buffer. So you might get so much yep. packet loss, right, Gary, that like yep. it'll even just buffer and it'll stop working because you can't you're not getting any video at all. Right. And and the thing with packet loss is that it, it may even be very subtle. Like you may send a thousand packets and only lose 25. Right. And which is not a big deal in, in scope because uh, our servers help compensate a little bit for that. But also with the network, we can extrapolate enough information to make sure the picture looks good. The, the difference here is that you, you may not see it as drastically as this. This is like terrible packet loss. Yeah. But it may just be that you're getting some aliasing on, you know, the crisp edges of, of an image, right, on stands or, or curtains or something that you're showing. Right. And then if you get enough packet loss occurring, the video just stops altogether. Maybe it even freezes or it just completely goes out because you're not seeing enough data and we're, getting, we're losing all the data. Yeah. No, that's really... Um... <laughs> That's really helpful. And I know we were um, going back to how to prevent packet loss. We were just streaming a virtual conference in upstate New York recently. Um, and the one way that we that really helped us avoid that, because we only had like 20 megs up altogether, and it was like an all-day conference, is we just told people 
there were about 10 of us at this farmhouse in upstate New York with a very limited internet connection. We just told people, hey, please like, do not get on the Wi-Fi and do not like log onto the network unless you absolutely need it. And that might be a little bit too extreme for some people, but to me, that's just a way of being like, okay, I know nobody's actually using this network because I didn't have the option to do QoS in that situation. Mm -hmm. Right, so. and that'll happen a lot of times to a lot of our clients and streamers where they don't have the ability to set up QoS. And so they, you know, there's gotta be a limitation. And I will say with this, uh, typically hardwired connections through your ISP, um, you're only gonna see packet loss if there's a major issue um, or even a beginning of a major issue. The more times you'll see packet loss occur is if you're using a hotspot or a cellular connection. Okay. okay? Because hotspots will, um, especially like if you're using Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, Sprint, whoever, um, hotspots, if they are throttled, you're going to immediately notice you're getting packet loss because they're throttling your connection down. They're squeezing that hose, that pipe, and you're trying to push so much data through that it just can't go. So just be aware of that. There's major differences between using an actual ISP hardwire and using a cellular connection in total. Okay. That's great advice. That's all, that's all we have for you today. Um, so I guess we'll uh, just want to give you a quick reminder. If you want to learn more, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got tons of stuff about live streaming on there, um, especially for beginner level live streamers. People are asking us all the time. Um, so feel free to subscribe. And then if, if you didn't, if you don't get a question answered today, cause we're about to hop in the live Q and A, just email us anytime at questions at boxcast.com. And uh, we are more than happy to help. So, um, Let's just dive into some questions here now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to roll back because I know we're I know we're having some audio sync issues because we're bringing you in from Columbus. And yeah. so there's some weird things happening in Rendezvous. And um, we're testing this. Thank you for being patient with us on, like, some of the sync issues because we're testing this, like, bring Gary in from Columbus for the first time type of thing. Um, so we appreciate your patience. Uh, we're just as human as everybody else when it comes to live streaming. <laughs> it's um, the internet, bro. Yeah. It's the internet. It's it's the internet for sure. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's dive into some questions I have for you here, um, Gary. I'm I'm about to queue them up. I'm about to rapid fire hit you with some. All uh, right. Okay. Do, 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 I do like hot chocolate with marshmallows. If that's one of the questions. Yes, that was the first question. Do you want me to give, give okay, good. Uh, okay, here's a great question. This is a good question to start off going back to the Pi example. First Baptist Knoxville asks, if you have a public network and a private network, are those two different Pies or is that the same Pi? Good question. Yeah, so <laughs> you have a private network and you have a public network. The question I have for you, First Baptist in Knoxville, is it is it on the same internet connection? Because if it is then yes, it's part of the same pie. Because separate internet connections would entail a separate connection types, which means separate connection speeds. And so if you have a private network and a public network, like a guest network, for example, you're still pulling off of the same network connection. So yeah, there it is the same if you have two. So the best way to do that, the best way to fix anything in that is to actually limit your guest network, the public network, like super hardcore and what i mean by that is i'll give you an example our church um we have a guest network we want to run an internet connection we have a guest network and then we have the private network that we use for our staff and our live streaming our guest network um we only allow one megabit a, a download and we allow 0.2 of upload Okay, so we are completely restricting that network, and most times people are just on Facebook, um, or they're you know they're jumping in their Bible app, or you know they're pulling up something really quickly like an email or text. So you don't need as much download and upload on a guest network. But yes, it is the same pie. Got it. Got it. They're both Apple Pie. Um, so for mm -hmm. <laughs> our next question, this is actually a really good one. Um, so somebody said your upload speed is 214 up. Let's say no one. Um, except you as live streaming, what would your streaming megabits per second be? So I'll actually take That's this one question. because I can show you how you can determine, in some, in some instances, you can control what your bit rate is going to be for your live stream. So if you're scheduling a broadcast, obviously in diagnostics, you can see here what your broadcast bit rate is going to be. The Boxcaster and Boxcaster Pro do adaptive bit rate streaming, like I mentioned. So they'll just pick the best 
bit rate that they can given your network circumstances, but you can also control it um, while you're streaming or before you go to schedule your broadcast. If you click edit broadcast, you can go into your advanced settings um, and get a little dangerous and you can actually set like a hard coded <laughs> bit rate here. Um, yes. And so if you have a preference and you just say, like, I want as much data going out as possible, um, the Boxcaster Pro tops out at 18 megabits per second. The Boxcaster tops out at 5 megabits per second. And you can just determine what you want those to be if if that's your jam. So that's yeah. how that works. Now, I, and then the CS team here, the technical support team, will actually tell you to hard code your box directly. So um, if you go into the sources area and click on your box caster and click edit settings. There's an advanced settings tab there as well where you can hard code the box directly. Sometimes hard coding on a, on a broadcast is a good idea. Um, just my two cents here because maybe you're at a different location and you don't want to have to do it to your box in full. But if you're standardizing in one location every time, then it might be a good idea to hard code your box directly and leave it at that. I mean, what we did for weddings too, what we cat that. What do we do for weddings? Yeah. Wait, here, I'll get it closer. Wade's coming to explain what we do for when uh, we're Wade, live streaming. Wade's our wedding. producer for the hey guys, morning. Wade here. I'll stand to the side. So for for weddings, when Josh and I live stream a wedding, we um we actually cap our boxcaster at 720p 30, and we actually cap it at two megs because we're using a cellular connection, and our cellular like hotspot thing it can do more than two megs. Like we're pretty confident in that. But one, we just want to be extra conservative. So that's a time where we're like, hey, we just want it to make sure we just want to make sure this 100 percent works, because if they kiss and say I do and the live stream's not working, uh, we're not we're not going to look too good in our stream. So <laughs> that's just what we do. A time when we limit it on our end. That's so. good advice. Yeah, that's good advice. Thanks. It, it, it really video, just guys. depends on your internet <laughs> connection in total, like where you're at, what you're doing, you know, how much bandwidth you actually have, you know, what is your upload speed. So yeah, yeah. that's that's all the really good devices. Yeah. Another really good question. Um, the Chinchu asks, any suggestions on routers to purchase for QoS? Um, so every router is different, OK? And I'm very, uh, how do I say this, Josh? Um, bias. <laughs> um, there, you're going to need to buy a router that's a little more advanced. Like if you go to the store and you go to Walmart and you've got that little Linksys like AC1200 router and, and, you know, it does like, you know, 300 megabits, that's probably not the router you want to use for setting up QoS. Okay. Um, so if you look at something more like the, the, I don't know, the Netgear Nighthawk, that is a little bit more um, because it can actually facilitate um, oh, that can QoS. do QoS. Yeah, it does. It does do QoS. It does do, uh, it, but it's a limited version, so you have okay. to be very selective. Well, I don't. There's not one particular router we can actually name for sure because we're also not in the recommendations business here, unfortunately. But what I would say is that if you go to um, like a Best Buy or if you go on Amazon and you do any researching, just make sure it says QoS in it and it'll allow you to manage it. Okay. Especially if you, instead of just doing even a, a router itself, if you do a network switch, the main word you want to look for is managed. Okay. You want to be able to get inside software and you want to actually manage it. But I would also highly recommend that you consult some sort of IT professional um, to make those recommendations easier for you. They may have a better system in place and something that might be easier to use. Okay. I posted a link of a Netgear Nighthawk that had QoS like listed on it just to give people a rough idea of where they can start. Perfect. But yeah, definitely. Yep. I mean, my recommendation would also be that. Like, what's up? I got a question for you. Or a question. A pop, yeah. Popular question. You can reiterate. A lot of people are still asking, like, what's the minimum upload speed for, like, Foxcast? I know it's yeah, Gary, okay, what's, but, the, yeah. what's the bare bones minimum to get a good quality live stream? Okay. So if we take into consideration anything that is uh, 720p, let's just say we're starting with 720p standard, right? 720p starts about one and a half megabits and goes all the way up to about two and a half, three. So what we need to do is you need to make sure you double that. So okay. three megabits, if you're doing the largest 720p you can do, which is a high quality 720p, you're going to need six as an upload, okay? So if we say six is a minimum, if you're doing 720p, then anything that you do with... 1080 is anything from three all the way up to five six and seven so just double the speed 
Okay. And using and using the the actual uh, chart that we had there, the little graph chart that showed those, it makes it all worthwhile because it it will help you understand that if you have a 720p stream and you want to push three megabits just double the speed and that's a good frame of reference is double the amount and speed that you're pushing in megabits because your upload speed may be either be drastically less or it could be significantly higher okay yeah that's a really that good sense yeah that makes a lot of sense that's good to know i mean it's always like a very subjective thing because it just depends on like also what do you want your video bit rate to be and and how mission critical is the broadcast but that's a very good number for for most boxcast customers to kind of to kind of have their back pocket. yeah and and it's a kind of it's not a hard rule like i mean we can't tell you and i'm just being honest here folks we can't tell you yes six is your absolute lowest right we can't mm-hmm. tell you that every network's different every connection will be a little different every way that you're going to stream is going to be a little different and we try to make it easier to standardize all that but really i mean if it was me i wouldn't go anything lower than 10 honestly and and that's just because i want plenty of headroom to be able to push it harder that's good I, I would completely agree with that. Um, somebody asked real quick, maybe Wade, you can cut back to the, the Boxcast dashboard here. Somebody was asking just where is diagnostics? I'll show one more time. So if you were to go in your, if you were to be in your dashboard living while you're live right here and you clicked view broadcast details, you would see the diagnostics tab right here. And then that's gonna help you monitor your live stream and click show alert history, show graphs, just like we had mentioned before. And this will help you give you all your all your data about how the network's performing. Um, so yeah, uh, let me look at a couple other questions. Uh, I know we're running a little bit out of time here. Um, oh, this is a really good one. Just came in hot uh, from Corey Gang. Um, can you talk about QoS versus DSCP? And now yeah. I am completely out of my element. <laughs> well, we're 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 approaching the end of the networking information here. Man. I know but we're no. in the we're um, deep in the woods now. So so QoS is setting bandwidth limitations and managing traffic. DSCP is uh, setting the priority of that device on the network for traffic. Okay, so what we recommend is that if you're going to set anything for DSCP, because there is an option inside of the Boxcaster. Um, and the boxes software right there in the dashboard that you actually consult a network professional or your IT manager because there are specific requirements for different values of DSCP and those are going to be different wildly across every managed network. Okay. That's a good one. That makes sense? Yeah, I'm glad you knew the answer to that. <laughs> Thanks um, for that, Corey. That's a great question, by the way, Corey, if you're watching. I appreciate that question. Not a lot of people understand the differences, and a lot of people don't understand what DSCP is. So we kind of just push it to the side because it's really not something that we handle or manage very often. And it's mm-hmm. more IT-specific, um, and, and a manager of that particular network would have a better understanding of that. Cool. Makes sense. Um this is another really good question from Trent Maddox. He asks, if the Boxcaster tops out at five megabits per second, very good question actually, um, does it make a difference having an upload speed of 10 megabits per second versus 50 if it's only gonna top out at five anyway? No, it doesn't make a difference, but it's always good to have plenty of bandwidth upload um, because the Boxcaster is limited in its hardware capability and it will accept five. And honestly, 1080p streaming for at five megabits is plenty good. Um, The thing about also with that is that we do some high quality compression over H.264, which is what the Boxcaster uses. So we can compress that signal. Is what we call it. Right, exactly. Yeah, so we can compress that a little bit better to fit and manage easier within tighter upload speeds. But no, it, it having 10 or 50 is not going to make a difference if the box can only achieve 5. You just have to make sure that if there's a spike or if that you're wanting to push harder, maybe even through RTMP, you got to have a bigger upload. Yeah. And it's only for safety reasons. I mean, it's not necessarily a hard and fast rule, but it's always a good thing to have. Have a little more than what you need is pretty much where I go. Yeah. Um, so, Josh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the questions, too, by the way, on YouTube here. Um, um, Tamika has asked the same question twice here. I want to address that if you're okay with that. Yeah, go for it. So, uh, does the speed um, make the lower third appear slow? Um, it, it can. Um, typically, that's actually something determined by your video switcher or if you're using cloud overlays with us. Um, but more so, 
uh, lower third information as it's coming through is not going to be affected by the speed itself. Um, it's still data either way, so it could if it's got packet loss, but not necessarily uh, going to change anything in general. That's a good answer. Um, also, I'll post a link because I don't know if, if anybody is uh, is 100% sure about this, but we actually have a streaming protocol with our Boxcaster and Boxcaster Pro called Boxcast Flow. Um, it's basically our special streamy sauce that we put on all of our live streams to make it crispy and, and look great. Um, it is proprietary. It's what our hardware encoders actually use specifically. So five megabits with the Boxcaster is different than like five megabits with like OBS, right? Because of right, the exactly. efficiency. That's the... raw. It's uncompressed data, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's just one thing to know. And that, that always gives me a little more confidence when I'm using our hardware versus using like like certain streaming softwares that we have to for certain situations because I'm like, okay, cool. I know the streamy sauce is going to help me out in this situation. Um, so yeah, I think that's a... Uh... Okay, so somebody asked, so, I do not have a Boxcaster and I have been using the service for the past month. Do I need the Boxcaster? No, you definitely don't mm -hmm. need to use our hardware to use our to get some of the benefits of our streaming platform. Um, we have a broadcaster streaming app. You can use programs like Wirecast. We're actually using Wirecast today to bring Gary in, and that's where I think we're getting some of the sync issues that we're having. Um, we're using uh, OBS, uh, or we do use OBS every now and then. OBS is a free program that you can download. You can use vMix with Boxcast. You can use virtually any type of encoder that can push an RTMP stream. Uh, you can right. use that with our platform. And I will, if I can just jump in and add one piece of the puzzle there, there, Josh. If you do have, do not have the Boxcaster, like Josh said, you don't need it. But a lot of times what will happen is like you don't have a fast enough computer for RTMP. Okay. Okay. And you're getting high CPU usage. You're getting lots of drop frames. You, every time you lower the quality or bit rate, it still doesn't make a difference. At that point in time, we would make the suggestion that you try the Boxcaster because of the fact that it has a better compression and it uses a, a, a proprietary encoding. So you would be a good candidate if you're experiencing those things. But no, you absolutely don't have to own a piece of our equipment to stream to Boxcast. That's a great answer. Um, so another question that somebody's asking, um, when I use, okay, this is a very good question because I've seen this happen too. When I use a dissolve on the switcher rather than a cut, the picture pixelates. Why is that? Because I've seen this happen. That's because is that adaptive bitrate in play or? No, most likely what's happening is because dissolve actually cuts pixels out as it goes. And you're seeing that if you, you're, you're going to be seeing that in, in general. So fades, fades are not as, um, friendly for live streaming cuts are always the best i mean that's what most professional broadcasters do is that they use cuts instead of fades unless you're you know you're having to fade to black obviously because black is empty space white is full space right so when in doing so you're moving that but no most likely and what i would suggest is if you're seeing that happen in your live stream um, double check your frame rates because that could be a part of the problem especially if you're using rtmp double check those frame rates make sure you're not dropping frames make sure that you're not seeing anything um, out of the ordinary with your bit rate that's a good answer um another question i've seen a couple times here uh people are asking um when they're using the box caster they're having issues with the audio levels being too low i know you get this one all the time so i figured <laughs> we'd just universally address it What's going on? I think some people might think it's network related, but obviously it's not. Can you explain the different reasons why audio might be too low coming out of the Boxcaster yeah. compared to what so like you might out... see on a monitor or like something like that? Right. Yeah. Check out our other video that you and I did, um, Josh, about um, you know how to get the best audio quality for your stream. Um, but what I can do is I'll give you a quick, simple uh, help, okay? Because there's no right answer to audio when it comes to streaming. All right everything's going to be different. Some people link up two consoles together. Some people just do it raw from one. Some people use a mainstream mix versus mixing it through like a mix bus or a, an auxiliary. So it's all going to be a little different. But the thing about the Boxcaster is that the Boxcaster is one volt at zero dB. Now, if that's Japanese to you, and that's okay, it can be. It just means that if you exceed zero dB, you're clipping, okay? 
it, likewise, most systems actually reduce volume, if especially if it's an analog system, mm -hmm. um, such as like an analog console. So it reduces the volume automatically by somewhere between 5 and 10 dB. So you have to make sure you pump a little extra juice into the system. And really, it just depends on your scenario, what console you're using and all that. And we can help with some of that. Um, most times we're going to have to you know, have you check a few settings, make sure you're pushing a little more gain in there. And we have quite a bit of help over in our articles about what to look for and where to go with that. But yeah. send, a, send, us a, send us an email at questions at boxcast.com. One of us is going to get that. We'll help you try to figure out your, your low audio vo volume issue. Yeah, I always, every time I'm producing a live stream, I have a separate mixer just to run to the Boxcaster just to control levels, and that usually helps a lot because then I can just monitor audio just for the live stream versus, like, what the house is getting or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. Another another good question is, um, is, uh, is it better to send audio directly from the mixer to the Boxcaster or through the HDMI mix? Okay, so that's a subjective question in all my honest opinion. <laughs> um, I, I'm a purist. I don't like to embed my audio because I want more control over it. Um, some people think it you know, would make it easier, and it probably is to embed the audio. Um, you mix it, embed it over, and it's embedded with the video um, at that point in time. So really it's a subjective question. I, I personally like the more manual touch um, because I like to be able to control volume levels a little bit better. Um, and it gives me a little bit of an easier manipulation from my console to my mm -hmm. pro or my actual box caster. But, um, it, you know, and it's either way is fine. It's just, it really depends on your setup. Yeah. Um, and I know that seems like I'm kind of dodging the question a little bit, but it's really dependent on what you prefer um, and what you think is best. And I, we highly recommend trying both. Do a couple of tests. So, I mean, I think we said that in the, in the webinar, test, 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 right? Always test it out, you know, yeah. do, set it up, test it out. Yeah. That's a good that's a good point. I mean, I personally I use a video switcher and I have an audio mixer going into the switcher, so I run everything through HDMI just to simplify it. But again, like you said, it's super subjective and it just depends on my answer would be whatever gives you most control over the audio levels, that's the right answer. Um, another good question cuz I don't know if we we probably didn't address this throughout the presentation, but it's about like live streaming delay. Um, somebody asked, why does it take a minute or so, Rick Huber, why does it take a minute or so for the stream to start when I start the stream on the dashboard? Let's Good talk question, about Rick. delay and let's talk about why BoxCast live streaming and, and Facebook live streaming and YouTube live streaming, why isn't it as instantaneous as Zoom and other like programs are used to that are more two-way? Good question. So whenever you live stream something, um, the nature of the internet is it has to get there. I mean, we don't travel from Columbus to Cleveland instantaneous. We have to drive, so it will take some time, right? So it's the same concept. Whenever you're sending data, regardless of from the Boxcaster or if it's from RTMP or even your device like your cell phone, like the iOS app, um, it's going to take time to get to us. Not only is it going to take time to get to us, but then we also transcode that data. So we have to receive it, put it all back together, and then transcode it. And what transcoding does is it basically takes your video, your high quality stream, and we cloud transcode. So it's the benefit of having Boxcast as a provider is that we take that 1080p 30 signal and then we divide it down into the various other formats and bit rates in order for other devices to be able to view it. So if you have a, a viewer who only has enough bandwidth to support maybe 240p or even 480p video, then we transcode it to do that. So it does take some time to do that. Typically, you're going to see delays of between 45 seconds to 90 seconds. And the only reason for that is because we use a specific codec, which is the H.264 codec. And that requires us to be able to send, have you send us data in segments, and each segment's 10 seconds long. And so we need about four segments to be able to display video after it's been per produced and processed. So. The fastest, I, I'm going to be honest, the fastest that I've seen streams is 20 seconds. The fa absolute fastest. I think Wade can attest to this. Like, we've seen uh, some RTMP streams and some Buscat streams come in in 20 seconds flat. So it's really network conditions play a big part in that. Um, your equipment and how you're mm -hmm. streaming it, your internet connection itself, and then, of course, we transcode everything yeah. on the back end. And for those of you that need um, a better visual or you just want to like dive into like why this happens a little more, I'm going to post like uh, uh, we have a really good blog post that explains the whole like structure of this. And it's why does my live stream lag? So I'll post that in chat and hopefully that can also 
provide some like graphics and visual for like actually what's happening here with yeah. the live streaming. Um, and I know even like live sports, you know, and like 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 anything like that that you watch over satellite, that's delayed too because it takes time for the video transmission to go up to a satellite and then get delivered to a television network that somehow I don't even know how it works, but I know there's usually <laughs> like a twenty to thirty second delay with live it's sports magic. too. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah. magic in a way. So there's always definitely is. some kind of delay when it's a one way broadcasting technology or streaming technology. Now Brian McComan here in the in the uh, in the questions chat there, he's got a great question and it's what would be the biggest source of a transcode delay? All right, Brian, you've asked a really good question, and I'm going to tell you it's a very deep answer, but I'm going to try to simplify it. Um, when your internet connection talks to our server, your internet connection, your encoder, whether it's Boxcast or RTMP, says, hey, Boxcast, I'm going to be sending you a 1,000 packets, and you're going to expect them at this time, okay? What happens with transcode delay is that you send us data packets or your network send us the data packets and somehow they're delayed, okay? So we're expecting them at a specific time and we get them either really late or shortly after they're expected to be there. And that's what calls transcode delay because we're waiting for that data to be received. We don't process anything until it gets there. So our API has to work a little harder and, and that's where you might see some buffering occur, right? Because that's a big thing people experience with live streaming is you might see buffering start to happen. And that's because we're not receiving the data packets. Nine times out of 10 when that occurs is you're actually seeing packet loss at, at the same time. Okay. Yeah, that sounds really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I tried to simplify yeah, it. Yeah, that's a good a answer. Great though. question, Brian, great question. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I'm not seeing a ton here else. Uh, there are there are a decent amount of questions about issues with simulcasting and like specific uh, things relating to, you know, like issues with individual live streams. Again, my advice is like, if you're having an issue with something, um, please reach out to us at questions at boxcast.com or call our support number. And then we can have a support rep like actually individually walk you through it. Because a lot of these questions, like sometimes they are based on your certain specific use case and they're they're not always one size fits answers. So maybe if you reach out to us we can have we can have a more custom answer for you that, that's actually more and accurate. always Yeah, and always check out our boxcast articles. A lot of the times like bitrate settings for OBS and wirecast, the best streaming uh, internet connections you could have a lot of those are listed right in our articles. And in fact, again, I'll reiterate, check out the need help button right in your dashboard. There's a search functionality right there that you can actually just do a one word search, type in bitrate or type in ISP, and you will be able to find articles related to everything that we've encountered and usually help information that we've actually specified um, for those fixes. Yeah, I mean, please don't, please don't be scared to reach out to support, they don't bite. Usually, <laughs> they're, they're it's really, Wade that usually has, yeah. You know, put the Wade's get, on. Wade gets a little feisty, but for the most part, you're gonna have a good experience. And and everybody just really wants, everybody really wants your live streams to succeed. So that's why I'm. Absolutely. I always recommend like, please contact us. Don't don't wait, don't wait until something goes wrong to reach out to us. Contact us ahead of time if you're testing something and it's not working. Um, oh yeah, I mean sure. that's a big one. That's a big one for sure. Plenty, plenty of time to do testing is important. Yeah, please, absolutely contact us. We don't, we're not, we want to make sure that you succeed in your live stream. I mean, in this day and age, right, Josh? It's a little harder to have personal time with, you know, especially churches or sports organizations, even government entities. So it's very hard to be personable and in person. So that's what we're here to do. We're here to make yeah. your viewers part of the experience. Yeah, absolutely. And we get it. I mean, we get it that you're probably like running around trying to do a ton of different things at once and you don't have the ability to just focus on your live stream you might be in a smaller organization i've been there too where i'm live streaming a wedding and i'm mixing audio while running the switcher while maybe even occasionally adjusting the pan on a camera because i <laughs> didn't have the budget for a camera guy so it can be really frustrating that's what that's just that's what the support team is there to do for you and they're there to help so i think that's i mean for the most part i think that's it Thank you so much for watching, Gary. Thank you for uh, you know coming in from uh, Columbus and helping today. You've been invaluable. I'm gonna keep asking you questions and keep figuring this stuff out on my own, but it's been super helpful. Um, awesome. So cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks for watching and uh, happy streaming. All right.